Okay, welcome, welcome. Um, this is the week three webinar of our online staff class, and thanks for coming. And I want to um, I want to actually start by introducing Kyle Stoker. And Kyle, um, Kyle was my student a while back and has been a tutor for stats for a few years now. And um, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, so I'm Kyle. I've uh, started with this class since winter of 23. And um, I sent a message out to everyone through Canvas. It should be in your inboxes, Mark Tutoring, with my hours on Cranium. And yeah, just come by and make an appointment and we'll be able to work on anything you need from the chapter assignments to your projects, discussion boards. I'd love to help. Great, great. Yeah. And again, take advantage of it. Kyle's awesome. And, you know, so any anything you need help on, um, Kyle will help out. Uh, let me talk about the plan today. We will start out, as always, if you have any questions, um, you can pop them into the chat. I always have one eye on the chat box, um, and I'll be happy to answer questions. And then um, we're actually moving into chapter three and four. So we're, we're doing two chapters this week. And it turns out that if we're doing two chapters, it means it's easier because <laughs> If there's just one chapter, that means it's a hard chapter. So these chapters aren't that bad. And the first chapter, chapter four, will be on discrete distributions. And the second, chapter five, will be on continuous distributions. So I'll do a little review of what it means to be discrete and what it means to be continuous. Then we'll look at the continuous distribution, uh, the discrete distribution, and we'll say, well, how do we create a probability distribution table for a discrete distribution? And we'll have an example of two of that. And then we'll get into the expected value and the standard deviation when we have a discrete distribution. And they're, they're actually real helpful for all kinds of things in life. Uh, it's one of those nice things about that. Uh, and I'll explain, talk about it, you know, how it works, kind of understand you know, what you're getting into when you get into something. So we'll talk about how to find and interpret the expected value and the standard deviation. And then we'll get into a special special type of discrete distribution, which is called the binomial distribution. And that pretty much is all about the yes, no survey question. So that's an important sur survey question type. And the binomial distribution will um, is kind of what it usually lies on, and we'll learn how to find probabilities and by, and going backwards also. Then we'll move on to chapter five, which is all about continuous distributions. So we'll talk about them, and it turns out the math for continuous distributions for general ones turns out to be really hard, which is good, which means for the general ones, you don't have to do the math. <laughs> you just let the computer do it for you. <laughs> um, but there is one type that you can do the math for, and that's called the uniform distribution. And we'll look at when we have a uniform distribution, how do you find a probability? And the math isn't that bad, but there's a little bit of math, a little algebra, but very basic algebra. And then finally, we'll say, what is the mean and what is the standard deviation for a uniform distribution? And we'll talk about those things. So that is the plan. Just a, a note, this is, this is um, week three, and three is an odd number. So there's no exam this week, which means that you have some extra time. And my, my strong suggestion when you have extra time is do the other stuff you need to do. And kind of the big thing that you should be kind of really making sure it happens this week is to have your project idea. And I wanna remind you when you come up with your project idea, and that should include what the survey question is gonna be. It should include who your client is. And it should also include what your sampling technique will be and how you're going to do that sampling technique. And once you have those down with your partners, hopefully there's three of you, then post them on the project one discussion board. Don't email them to me, post on the project one discussion board. And then I'll look at that and I'll let you know what either whether it works, sometimes it just doesn't work. 
And sometimes it works, but it needs some modifications. And I'll let you know some modifications that have to happen. I just want to let you know, because it's already happened. And that is, um, remember that one of the pieces of project one is to make sure you have a stem and leaf diagram. So if you have a survey question where almost all the answers are just single digit numbers, or maybe numbers from 10 to 10 to 19, then um, it really won't work because the stem and leaf diagram doesn't work if that's all you've got. Okay, there has to be more of a mix of, them, of that answers. So that's just a note on something that I've noticed that kind of has some problems. Another one to note is that don't even, if you think you can do a simple random sample, probably need to think again because they're pretty much impossible. So that's the other thing that I noticed. Um, the other thing that you should do is you can look at the Project One discussion board and look where people have posted their ideas and then click on the replies and it'll show my reply on what works and what doesn't work. And then you'll get an idea of what's working. Okay, don't just copy theirs, but you'll get an idea of what works or what issues there might be. So that's a, a big deal about the project. So are there any questions at all about anything? Always happy to answer any questions. Okay, if there's no questions, and then I'm gonna move on to a little review of the discrete and continuous variables. So this is a reminder, we've already had it, but it's so important that we need to do it, you know, it's good to have a reminder since there's a whole chapter on discrete variables and a whole chapter on continuous variables. So a discrete variable is a quantitative variable whose set of outcomes can be displayed as a list. So remember quantitative is a very important word. One thing is that for your project, the answer to the survey question must be quantitative. So none of this yes, no stuff, not, you know, California is your answer, that wouldn't be a number. Quantitative means that you have a number as, a, as an answer. And discrete means you can actually just list pretty much all of the outcomes in a table or at least as a list, okay? Sometimes you have to have dot, 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 but, but it basically has to be kind of a list that you can explain, okay? Quantitative variables that are not discrete are called continuous variables. Okay, so that's when you still have a number as an answer, but now there's no way of writing a list out. Okay, and for a discrete variable, a probability distribution table can always be created. So a little grammar, and you may not have thought much about this grammar. Um, I actually, uh, I actually learned about it <laughs> when I when I went to lived in Japan, and realized that. Um, we have the grammar and they don't, it turns out in Japan, if you know, speak Japanese, but um, I did learn Japanese. And uh, the grammar that, that corresponds to discrete is like how many, whereas the grammar that corresponds to continuous is more of a how much, okay? It's not perfectly the answers, but that's for most of the time. So things like a discrete variable might be, you know, how many how many days did you go to a gym this year? Okay, because you could list all the possibilities. That would be zero, one, two, three, dot, 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 all the way to 366, I guess, since it's a leap year. Okay, and that's a, that's a list of all the possibilities. Even if it's a long list, it's still a list. Okay, and that would be discrete. On the other hand, if the survey question was saying something like, um, how much time did it take you to, uh, to make breakfast this morning? And, and that's asking exactly how much time. So it, it might have taken me seven minutes, four seconds, point one, two, nine, seven, three, four, one, dot, 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 seconds. There's no way you can list all the possible numbers. So when it comes to like a length of time, so that would be continuous. Any questions on that idea? Any questions? Okay, and again, feel free to ask questions whenever you have them. That's kind of the whole point. 
Okay, and next, okay, oh, I did want to mention one more thing that I forgot to mention in my introduction, and that is I did grade the exams. So your first exam, week two exam, it was called, I graded it, and you can look on Canvas and see a grade for that. Okay, and the way it works is a computer graded the first, I think, like 11 questions or 12 questions, and the last two questions were more essay kind of questions. So I grade those because computers aren't so good at that. So just to let you know that when you first submit, your grade is going to look pretty bad because the computer automatically gives you a zero for those. But then I change those essay questions to whatever you deserve in terms of the points you got. So if you look again, I graded those yesterday afternoon and your grade hopefully is higher than it was before. And that's just a big note, okay? That that's how the grading works. Um, probably later today, if I have enough time, I'll be grading your discussion posts because they take a lot of time to grade, so a couple of days. So that's just a big note in terms of, of uh, grading. All right, so now let's talk about a discrete variable. Okay, so here's here's an example that I have. Okay, and this is kind of a typical to, to money example, and most of you can understand money, so it's a good one to you know, try out and make sure it all works. And that is a car salesperson gives out a $10 gift to every customer who test drives a car. Okay, and that kind of stuff happens. Um, car companies will often do that. They'll give you a gift if you come and test drive, and then they're going to hope, of course, that you actually are... Um, going to buy a car because if you don't, then they've wasted their 10 bucks. So let's suppose that 12% of all customers who test drive a car purchase the base model of the car, resulting in a $200 commission for the salesperson. Okay. The salesperson is the one who has to pay the $10 gift certificate, by the way. 8% of all customers who test drive a car purchase the deluxe model of the car. And then the salesperson gets a $300 commission. Okay, do you understand that that's a discrete variable because there's only three things that could happen? One is they can, uh, the customer could buy the base model. The other is the customer could buy the deluxe model. And the third thing is that the customer doesn't buy anything. And each of those three things are going to have, turns out, different numbers. Okay, different amount of profits, because that's what you care about as a salesperson is how much profit you're making. So that makes it discrete. There's exactly three choices. That's very much um, three things you can list pretty easily. And notice that the, the answer to the survey question is very quantitative because it is how much profit did you make would be the survey question. Any questions on the example first? Okay, so then what we want to do, and this is really important, is we want to be able to make a probability distribution table. And to do that, we need to get all, we need to get all of the outcomes, so as we call those the values of x, and we need to get the probabilities for each of the outcome occurring. So let's go look at it. Okay, so first thing, the outcome of the profits. And if, if the sales per, if the person, if the customer purchases a base model, then there's a $200 commission. But the salesperson had to give them $10. So the profit is the amount that you get minus the amount that you have to spend. If you get $200 and you spend $10, then 200 minus 10 is 190. So that'll be your first, your first possibility for a profit, okay? Or at least one of the profitability, possibilities for a profit. Okay, for the next one, if the customer purchases the deluxe model, then the salesperson gets a $300 commission, but remember they had to spend $10 for the gift. So if you take 300 
minus 10, you end up with 290. And that would be the second value that could happen for the profit. Okay. A lot of times people forget that there's a third value. The third value happens most often, it turns out. That means the customer doesn't buy a car. And if the customer doesn't buy a car, then the salesperson doesn't collect any money. But the salesperson had to give a $10 gift certificate out to the, to the customer. So if you take zero, which is how much the uh, salesperson gets, minus 10, which is how much the salesperson had to spend, zero minus 10 is negative 10. Any questions on how I came up with the profit, all the different X values? Any questions on that? Okay, if there's no question, the next thing you want to do is you want to find the probability of each of those happening. And it's kind of given, at least the first couple, 12% purchase the base model. So that means the probability of profiting 190, that was the base model profit, will be 12%. And remember, you move the decimal over two places to the left to turn it into a decimal. So the probability will be 0 0.12, okay? Similarly, there's an 8% chance the customer is gonna purchase the deluxe model. So move that decimal over two places. Okay, note 8% is not 0 0.8. 8% is 0 0.08, because we needed to have the two decimal places move. The first one moves it just to the left of the eight, the second one, you're going to have to stick in a zero and move it there. So 8% is 0 0.08. Any questions so far? All right. How do we find the probability that the customer ends up losing money? Gets a negative 10 for the customer's X value. Any idea on how you might want to do that? Any thoughts on how you would find the probability that the customer doesn't buy the car or any car? I don't think you're jumping in. The key is a total probability always equals one. Okay, ah, you got it. Kind of, you got the idea. So the total probability equals one, and the total probability, if you it means add up all the probabilities. Zero point one, two, plus 0 0.08, plus the probability we don't know. Let's call that P for the probability, the, the one that we don't know, and that's the probability that the customer lost. I mean, the, um, the salesperson, you know, earned a negative $10 or lost 10 bucks. And that has to be equal to one. So now what we can do is we can subtract 0.12 and subtract 0.08. And we get P is equal to 1 minus 0 0.12 minus 0 0.08. Any questions so far? OK, and that you're allowed to put in the calculator if you want. And um, I can do it in my head, but you don't have to. So 12% plus 8% is 20% or 0.2. 1 minus 0.2 is 0.8. Any questions on finding the all three of the probabilities? Okay, if not, then the next step the next step is to write down a probability distribution table. And here's how it looks. And there's kind of two ways of writing it. There's this way, which you write it in rows. You can also write it in columns. Um, whatever fits best <laughs> is the way you want to do it. And rows tends to fit best for this particular example. Okay, it just fits on the paper better or on the screen better, I guess. So what we first do is we write down all the X's that can happen. The first was 190. The second was 290. 
and the third with negative 10. And then the second row, or columns if you want to do columns, will be the probability of x, which is the probability for each of those. And we've already done these calculations. We found them. The first probability of uh, getting $190 for a profit is 0 0.12. The probability of getting $290 is 0 0.08. And the probability of getting negative $10 or losing $10 is 0 0.8. Any questions? Any questions on finding a probability distribution table? All right. Here's the here's the point of all this stuff. Let's suppose, let's suppose you're the car salesperson. What do you most care about? when you look at these numbers. What's the most important thing when you're thinking about whether you want to, you want this job or not? You're looking for a job. <laughs> and what do you care about? Especially based on the, the, the data or the numbers. The ch there's a chance of success of making money. That's a small piece of it. But more important is what's your salary going to be? How much money are you going to make? Let's say you did this for a year. Okay, which means you see customers, you know, every day, lots and lots and lots and lots of customers throughout the year. And you want to say, you know, how much money are you going to make per customer? Does that make sense? Now, each customer is going to be a different amount of money. But over the long run, you want to say, well, what's kind of the average amount that you're going to make? Any questions on that? So that's the most important thing is, you know, what, what's, your, what's your salary going to be, which is the average profit, okay? And the salary will fluctuate from day to day. But on average, that's what matters. Any questions on the idea? Okay, so here is the template for what's called the expected value. The expected value is kind of that long-term average. And I have a little template on how to interpret and use the expected value. And what it says is, if many trials are done, then it is very likely that the average of the trials will be very close to the expected value. And I want to let you know I highlighted many, likely, average, and close to. This is the first time I've done that specifically in one of these kind of things. Any thoughts on why I highlighted it? This is very important why all these different words are highlighted. Any thoughts? So why do you think they're highlighted? We're gonna do this more than once, by the way, in this course. We're gonna have different things that are highlighted like this. Okay, they're the key words, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna use a word that's much better. Or, or you're going to care more about. And they're important, that's true. But here's the deal. If you use those words, I give you a significant number of points when I grade. And that's whether I grade your project discussion assignment or whether I grade your exam. When there's a, If I ask you to interpret expected value, then... If you don't have those words, you lose a lot of points. If you have those words, you get a lot of points. So do you promise you'll include those words? <laughs> when you're asked, and you will be asked, by the way, that's a promise, you will be asked to interpret an expected value. It won't be about, um, you know, car salesperson and that. It'll be some other example, but you're going to be asked to do it. Okay.
And that, by the way, also is going to, that includes the discussion post this week. You're going to have to do it. Okay, so it is very important. Okay, so have these down. Okay, if you include them, you get points. If you don't include them, you lose points. Okay, and a significant number of points. So now we want to find the expected value. Okay, there is a formula for expected value and standard deviation, by the way. Standard deviation, we've already kind of learned, and I'll go over that again, but we've already talked about standard deviation um, in the past, and that's the same meaning. So any guess on how you're going to find the expected value and the standard deviation, given that there's a nasty formula for both of them? Any thoughts on how you're going to find them? So you jump in, let me show you how you're going to find them. You're going to go to the calculator. Okay. And as I mentioned for this class, I made a calculator that is focused on this course. And we do things in the order at which the course goes. So you'll notice last week, we talked about statistics. We talked about Z-scores. We also did combinations. So what do you think, what number calculator do you think we need to use? And it should, I also tried to make it very obvious if you read through the list. Yeah, number six, expected value and standard deviation. Okay, so I tried to make this calculator as easy as possible. And let you, I wanna let you know if there's ever something that's confusing and you have a suggestion, um, please suggest it. I made the calculator so I can make changes. When I first made this calculator, it was a lot harder to use and then your past students and courses, you know, before your, they gave me great suggestions, and because of them, you have a really good calculator. So you can thank your former students, and if you find anything that can be done better, then do that, and that will not only help you, but it'll help the future, which is always a good thing. And hopefully, you agree that helping helping future people is a good thing. So I'm going to click expected value and standard deviation. Okay. And for a reason that um, really has to do with um, kind of size limits, especially for example, if you're using a cell phone, um, I made these in columns because cell phones are small and they're like, like this shape, they're column shaped. <laughs> so I made these in columns. I have the instructions, enter the outcome of the probability of that, um, that outcome occurring, then hit calculate. Well, I guess I should drop that first. That. Got to remember to do that. Okay. Leave the bottom rows that do not have any values blank. Mm -hmm. Do not include commas in your entries. Okay. And that's that's something I added, you know, somewhat recently because if with this, if you have an example, instead of, you know, 180, let's say you had 180,000, don't put 180, 000. Make sure you just put 180000. So never put commas in this calculator because it has trouble. Computers do weird things. So now what I do is I have 190, 290, and negative 10. So I plug them in. 190, 290, and negative 10. Any questions on that so far? Okay. And the probabilities were 0.12, 0 0.08, and 0 0.8. So I type them in. So 0 0.12, 0 0.08, and 0 0.8. Any questions? OK, and then I scroll down a little bit. And by the way, I set it up. So what do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine, 10 outcomes. If you need more than 10 outcomes, then you can't use this calculator. You have, you're going to have to use the spreadsheet I made, for example, will do it. Um, but I will let you know there will never be a homework problem, <laughs> you know, or I'll call it a, a chapter assignment question that, that has more than 10 outcomes. So pretty much anything you're going to be doing for the class you're not going to need more than 10 outcomes. 
Okay. In the real world, you could maybe sometimes have more than 10, but not for this class. And then I hit the calculate button. And there we go. So we have the expected value of 38 and the standard deviation. I'm going to go two decimal places because um, this we're talking about money. And that way it sounds like dollars and cents. So that'd be 98.47. Don't forget to round if you're going to go to a certain number of dust places. So 38, 98.47. Okay, so what that tells you now we can use our template. And here comes a template. And I'm going to show you that I'm using the words I told you we need to use. If many customers come to test drive a car, then it is very likely that the average profit that the salesperson will make per customer will be very close to $38. Any questions on that interpretation? All right, just a note, see if you know. Um, how long do you think it might take to work with a customer when they test drive the car? How much time do you think it takes? If you were the salesperson, how much of your time are you taking? Any guess? Okay, so if you think it's about an hour, then this job, on average, makes $38 an hour. Do you see how that works? That's a way of thinking about it. Notice that if it does take an hour to test drive a car, there will never be an hour where the salesperson makes $38. Okay, because the only choices are 190, 290, and negative 10. So this is an average amount of money or profit the salesperson is making per customer. It's not any particular customer's expense or payment. Any questions on that idea? Okay. The standard deviation is 98.47. Is that big or is that small? What do you think? Is that a big standard deviation or a small standard deviation? Yeah, it's a big standard deviation. If the average is $38 and the standard deviation is $98.47, that means that there will be times when you lose a lot, you lose money. There'll be times when you make a whole lot of money. There'll be whole days when you don't make money. Does that make sense? So kind of what this means when you have a high standard deviation with this kind of idea is the salesperson better have money in the bank to afford basic needs for the days when the salesperson loses money. Because there will be days when the salesperson loses money for the job they're working. Okay, and there'll be great, great days for the salesperson where the salesperson makes a lot of money. But if the salesperson makes sure that the salesperson has a significant amount of money in their bank account, then it's not... If they lose money for a day, they can afford it. Do you see how that works? And that's a good life skill, by the way. Okay. If your life or your job tends to go up and down, tends to have a high standard deviation in terms of money, then you should have a lot of money in your savings account. Okay. On the other hand, if every week is like exactly the same amount of money that you have to pay, then you don't need a lot of money in your savings account because then you have a small standard deviation. Do you see how that works for the standard deviation? Any questions on that?
Okay, there's no questions. Let's do another example. Okay, and this, this example says the following. Let me make it a little bigger to make it easy to read for you all. Okay, you've been offered a life and dismemberment insurance policy that costs $1,000 per year. Um, I noticed that a lot of people don't know what this word means. Do you, do you know what the word dismemberment means? Hint is it's not a good thing. Do you know what that means? Because you have a life and dismemberment insurance policy. Yeah, it's something like losing a body part. So eh, that's not a good thing. <laughs> Having your hand sawed off. Okay, that would be really, really bad. Okay, but not as bad as dying. <laughs> Hopefully, right? <laughs> okay, so that's a typical insurance policy. And pol insurance policies often do that. Okay, the policies pays the heirs $100,000 in the event of death. Okay, if you die, you don't get any money, you're dead. But your heirs, if you have children, for example, they get money. That's how life and life life policies work. And at fifty thousand dollars to you, in the event of its dismemberment. Okay, so there's your there's the policy. The actuaries, okay, the actuaries are the people, the statisticians who actually do the research to find out all this stuff. They have determined that you have a 0.3% chance of dying this year and a 0.5% chance of dismemberment this year. Okay, it's a small chance. Okay. Find the expected value in the standard deviation. Interpret the expected value, then explain why the standard deviation might indicate that it might still be a good idea to purchase the insurance. Okay. Obviously, depending on your situation. So we do the same thing. We see what can X be, okay? One of the things that could happen is that you could die. <laughs> what is the profit for your family <laughs> if you die? I know you don't want to die. <laughs> I hope you don't want to die, but you know, that can happen. Let's hope it doesn't. What is the, pro what, what is the profit if you die? Any ideas? Okay, I don't see you typing in. The idea is your heirs get $100,000, but the policy costs $1,000. So the profit will be $99,000. Any questions on that? Okay. And then what is a profit if you get dismembered? If you have your leg chopped off, <laughs> what's your profit for this insurance? Yeah, 49,000, because $50,000 is what you got minus 1,000, that's 49,000. I'm particularly not putting commas in, but for the calculator, it doesn't want commas. How about if you don't die and you don't get dismembered, what's your profit? Yeah, negative a thousand. You lose a thousand dollars. By the way, which of the three are the best? Which which of these three is the best thing that could happen? A profit of ninety nine thousand, a profit of forty nine thousand, or or a loss of a thousand. Which is the best thing that could happen? No, not a profit of 99000 The best thing that can happen is a loss of $1,000. Okay, if you really think it, it's the profit of 99000 you probably need to go to a psychiatrist. Okay, because you don't want to die. <laughs> so how, getting a profit isn't always a good thing. This is an example where getting a profit is a horrible thing. Okay, it's much better to not make money on your insurance. Do you believe me? I hope so. Okay, so I want to keep that in mind is that 
good and bad is not the same thing as high profit and low profit for insurance. Okay, now we get the probabilities. Well, there is a 0.3% chance of dying. What is that probability then? What number should I put into the table? So a lot of people have trouble with this. So what number should go into this table? Yeah, good, good. If you take a percent and you want to turn to a decimal, you got to move the decimal over two places. So the first one makes it on this side of the zero, and the second one, you add another zero. So you get 0 0.003. And similarly, the profit, if you get dismembered, is 0.5% chance, which is 0 0.005. Okay. And then... The probability of losing $1,000 will be 1 minus the sum of those two things, or 1 minus 0 0.003 minus 0 0.005, which is 0 0.9, which is going to be 0 0.992. Any questions on finding this profit finding, and finding the probabilities? I mean, Okay, then we do what we did before. If we go to the calculator. And by the way, if you want to get rid of all these, the easiest thing to do is just refresh the screen. If you refresh the screen, everything gets erased. So then we have the three choice, the three X's, which are 99,000, 49,000, and negative 1,000. We have our probabilities, which are 0 0.003, 0 0.005. Okay. And the final one was 0 0.992. Any questions on putting it in the calculator? I scroll down. Find the expected value. My expected value is negative 450. And my standard deviation is $6,495.96, rounded to the nearest penny. Any questions on that? Very long day for you. Huh? How did how did we know? How did we know that the expected value was going to be negative given the situation? Any any thoughts? This is not a math question, but it's important to understand reality. Any ideas? Right? I don't see it because the, the reason is this is an insurance company. They need to make money. If the expected value is positive, they're losing money because they have to give it to you. And remember, they're going to have, you know, thousands of customers. So we're talking about many, 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 and they need to make money. Okay, so on their side of the coin. On their side of the coin. Um, they're making $450 per customer on average if they have lots of customers, okay? Or at least close to 450, okay? Any questions on that? Okay, this is one of those, just for time purposes, I'm gonna say it kind of quickly, is that we can say that if many customers take this insurance, then it is likely that the average profit per customer or customer's family, because they die, um, 
will be very close to 400 and a loss of $450 per customer. Any questions on that? The standard deviation is very high. Okay. $6,495.96. So that means that some are going to lose a lot more. Some are going to gain money and a whole lot of money. Okay. This is one of those things where, you know, th this is very important. This expected value is very important to the company who's selling. To the person, there's more to it than just the, you know, the expected value. There's how important is it for this to happen, for this, you know, 99,000 profit to happen when you die. And the idea is, for example, if you have a small child, probably you probably want to make sure that there's some money in your insurance so that it happens in that small probability. Do you see? If you have no, no important depend dependents, then no reason to buy insurance. Okay, other than dismemberment, but not the life insurance part. Any questions on that? Okay, let's go to the next little piece. And the next is to talk about the binomial distribution. Okay, which is very important. So a binomial distribution comes from multiple independent trials of a yes, no question and measures the number of yes answers. Okay, so imagine, imagine conducting a survey and maybe your survey might be, do you plan on voting for Harris for president? Okay, yes or no. Okay, and what you want to do is you want to say how many people say yes out of your sample. Do you see? So that would be one example of the use of binomial distribution is you want to say that, but one of the problems with that is that if you don't know ahead of time what the population is, it's going to be very hard to do this calculation. If you know ahead of time what the population percent is, then it's much easier. Okay, so let me give you an example where um, that I used. Okay, and here, uh, here meaning in Tahoe. Okay, so here meaning in Tahoe, um, when I say I used what I really mean, any guess? What happens in Tahoe that doesn't happen in a lot of other places? Yeah, gambling. Okay. And um, I don't do it anymore. But when I was younger, you know, 21, 22, 23, um, I did a lot of gambling. Do you, think I, do you think I won when I gambled? Any thoughts? What's your guess? Yes, no, you're not guessing. <laughs> okay, so the answer is yes. The answer is yes. It doesn't mean I won every game, but pretty much every day that I gambled for the day, I made a lot of money. Um, and that is because I was able to calculate the probabilities and decide when it was a good idea to gamble and when it was not a good idea to gamble. Any questions on that idea? Okay, and it was it's a lot of math to calculate the probabilities, but I did that. I was able to calculate the probabilities. And each time, it's pretty much a, you know, pretty much a yes, no. You win or you lose. <laughs> that's kind of what usually happens in gambling. Um, I don't gamble anymore, and that's a long story, um, but there was a time when I gambled. Now I gamble in the stock market. So, and that's also, you know, that's not quite as um, binomial. So the idea here is 
you have a kind of yes, no. And let me give you an example that's very relevant. Okay. So let's look at the following. Okay. And by the way, you can quote me on this. I actually researched this up. There have been 142 years in recorded history of global temperature. Okay. So for the past 142 years, we have actually, you know, we as in the human race has calculated the, the average temperature on earth. Okay. Okay. Not a hundred percent perfect, but close enough that it does what you need. Okay. In the next 20 years, if the weather is random, find the probability that at least 10 of them will be in the top 10 of those 20 years of the prior 142 years. Do you understand what the question's asking? Any questions on the question? Okay, so the first thing is, this is a binomial distribution. Because each of the years of these 20 years, is, you can think of it as an event. And what we're looking at, we want to find the probability that at least 10 of them will be in the top 10. So either you're in the top 10 or you're not in the top 10. Does that make sense? Because we're, we're using that as our, our study. What is N going to be? Okay. And again, N, N represents the number of trials. So we say multiple independent trials. N represents the number of trials. So what is N in this case? What number is it? Any thoughts? Let's see, jumping in, but N is 20, because we're going to be looking at 20 different years and seeing which of those years are in the top 10. We're going to look at 20 years. So N is 20. Any questions on that? Okay, now though it's a probability, given we're gonna we're gonna assume, which is not an, always a good assumption, in this case it's a bad assumption we're going to, we're gonna assume that everything is random. Okay, then what's the probability that you're gonna be in the top 10? Because that would be a yes answer. The question is, was that year in the top 10 of the last 142 years? And it's actually not that hard to calculate because there are 10 in the top 10 out of 142. Remember, probability is a, quote, a, a fraction where the numerator is how many make it happen, and the denominator is how many different things are there. There's 142 years we're looking at, and there's 10 that make it happen. Any questions on that? All right, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna go to the calculator. We want the probability, and by the way, we want the probability that at least 10, this is very important, at least 10 in symbols is the same as greater than or equal to 10. Any questions on that? Okay, so now I'm gonna go back to the calculator menu. This is not an expected value problem. And which calculator do you think I'm going to use for this question? What calculator number? Yeah, number seven, binomial distribution. So we're going to find a probability when it involves a binomial distribution. Okay, and it says enter the lower bound for the number of successes, which is low. The upper bound for the number of highs, that's the high. The number of trials, trials. And the probability of scores P and then hit 
of success, P, and then hit calculate. All right, so we got to understand what these things mean, low, the high. So we want the probability that X is greater than or equal to 10. What's the lowest number that's greater than or equal to 10? The, the, the hint, yeah, it's 10. It's really easy. 10 is the lowest number that's greater than or equal to 10. What is the highest number that could happen with this experiment or this study that is greater than or equal to 10? Yeah, 20. Okay. How many trials are being conducted? Also 20. And what is the probability that we already did? That's going to be 10 over 142. Any questions so far? So I can go to my calculator. We had a 10 for the low, 20 for the high, trials is 20. And then um, you can't use a fraction for P here. So you have to hit scientific calculator and just type it in. 10 divided by 142. And I can just copy and paste this fraction, I this decimal, and put it into our probability. Any questions on that? And I hit calculate. What do I get? Zero. OK, that can happen. That definitely can happen. So the probability is zero. Well, let me put it here, it is equal to zero. Here's what that tells us. One thing is, let's see if you know, if we look in the last 20 years, okay? The last 20 recorded years, this year hasn't been recorded yet because we're not done with the year. But if you look at uh, 2014 to 2023, I'm uh, sorry, 2004 to 2023, it turns out that 10 of those years were in the top 10. But you have a probability of zero of that happening. What does that tell you? If you have a probability of zero of something happening and that thing happens, what does that tell you? It's going to be global warming, but, but what does it tell you, at least in terms of study, it tells you something is wrong. Something's wrong with what we did. And here's what's wrong with what we did. This is in the definition right here. This says that it comes from independent trials, which means that today would be the same as 100 years ago in terms of the chance of it being warm. So what you can get from this, okay, and by this is real data, is when you have a probability of zero of something happening, that means the assumption that they were independent is wrong, that we are in a period of global warming. Okay, and that's pretty much a mathematical proof of that. Any questions on that? Okay, so uh, I care about the environment. Maybe you don't, but <laughs> I do. And I look at things like that and I say, all right, we've done the statistics. There's no debate anymore. Okay, anybody who understands science and statistics can see that we're in a new time. There's no question. It's not some random thing. It's not random at all. So that's when you work with, you know, the politicians and scientists and all that to come up with a plan. So I want to let you know that statisticians don't work alone. Statisticians work with scientists, with politicians, with whatever it is so that statisticians can provide them the important information 
so that they can make good decisions. Any questions on that idea? So I'd like to tell you how important statistics is. Okay, if you didn't have the statistics, then you, you'd say, well, you know, if this probability instead of zero was like point, point 0.41, you'd say, well, maybe we're not in global warming. Do you see that? Okay, but we're in global warming and it, it just shows it. All right. Let's do one more of these until we, and we'll get to the continuous stuff, which is a little shorter. Okay, I'm gonna do these quickly. 24% of people worldwide feel lonely. Okay, I looked this up, kind of sad, but it's true. If 17 randomly selected people are surveyed, what's the probability between five and 10 of them feel lonely? Okay, so here we have 24% feel lonely. So that means, P will be 0.24. We want the probability that between five and 10 feel lonely. So the low will be five, the high will be 10, and they surveyed 17 people. So there'd be a, about a 38.75% chance. Any questions on that? Okay, how about the probability that at least six of them feel lonely? One of the hard parts for a lot of people is reading the word at least and knowing what it means. So at least six, the smallest at least six could be is six. So that'll go now, it'll go six for the low. It'll go 17 for the high for at least, and the rest is the same. And there's my calculation, 0 0.2049. The next one is fewer than five of them feel lonely. What's the smallest number that's fewer than five? It's supposed to be easy. Smallest number that's fewer than five? Not sure. Zero, right? You can't have you can have negative number of people. So the smallest number is zero. Feel lonely. All seventeen of them say, "Yeah, I'm not lonely." Do you see how that works? What's the largest number that's fewer than five? Yeah, four. Notice it's not five. Five's not fewer than five. Four is fewer than five. And then trials and P are the same. And there we go, 61.21% chance. Okay, exactly five feel lonely. Okay, what's the smallest number that's exactly five? Also very obvious. Five. What's the largest number that's exactly five? Five again. <laughs> And it calculate, and there's an 18.3% chance, or 0.183 probability, that exactly five of those 17 people feel lonely. Any questions on this example? Okay, now I'm gonna move on and we're gonna do continuous. All right, so with a continuous distribution, you cannot draw a table because it doesn't work that way. Discrete distributions, you can draw a table. Instead, what you do typically is you do draw a picture. Do you remember the shape that this picture is? It starts low, it goes up, and then goes back down in one word. Do you know what we call that in this class? We talked about it. You remember? Not sure. The shape of that was normal. Yeah, bell is what kind of a, a non-scientific way of saying it, but normal is the way we say it in this class. So this is a normal distribution. And let's suppose we want to find the probability of being between 1.8 and 2.75 for this normal distribution. Okay, so what I want to let you know is that would be the area under the curve 
in between those two numbers. And have you had calculus? Have you already had calculus? Most people say no. What do you say? Have you had calculus? Yeah, the answer is usually no for most. Okay, um, which means don't even try <laughs> to do this like by hand or something. You're not gonna find that area, okay? Computers will do it, okay? I had, I've had calculus and I teach calculus, but so I, I can do it, but, and I could do it to an estimate. I can't be, no one can get it exact, it turns out, but you can get an estimate. So it turns out this one doesn't work because we want an area and this is some weird shape curve thing. We don't have a formula for that. There is one area, one type of area that hopefully you know, that everyone knows how to find the area of. What is the first area that you learned as a child? Area of a, what shape? Yeah, square. And then kind of a modification of square is a rectangle. So what we're gonna be doing, because it's the easiest example, it does come up sometime. Normal is much more important, it turns out, but that's hard, so we're not doing that. We're gonna do the easiest example, and that is a uniform distribution. So a uniform distribution from A to B is a distribution such that any two given intervals of length K that is contained in A and B has the same probability of occurring. And any interval outside of A and B has a zero probability. And the shape of the distribution curve in this case is a rectangle. And we'll write x for the variable. And this little guy, this is called a tilde. Okay. It, the funny thing is, is that um, if you've ever taken Spanish, you learn this. So, um, and I don't know, have you had Spanish before? Have you taken it or learned it? Okay, good, good. So you've seen it because uh, the Spanish al alphabet actually has that little tilde over the N and they call that an N. -ye. Okay, I had five years of Spanish a long time ago. Um, so if you've had Spanish, you've seen the N -ye, and that's, a, that's that tilde above the N. But in math, we use it to say, in, in this case in statistics, to say has the distribution that is. So X has the distribution that is uniform, U for uniform, with low A, and high B. Any questions on the way to write it? Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to do some examples. And to do the example, let's read it. Suppose that the time that students spend in the math with a math tutor, okay, is uniformly distributed between 10 and 20 minutes. By the way, when I say suppose, it's probably not really true, but we're gonna use it as an example, okay? So what we can write is X tilde U 10 comma 120. Any questions on how to write down this distribution? Any questions? Okay, so now the question is the following. If a randomly selected student who uses a math tutor is observed, find the probability that the student will spend between 30 and 70 minutes with the tutor. Okay, so this is gonna be a step-by-step -step process. Okay, first thing, recognize the word uniform. Okay, we know that we have a uniform distribution, so we're gonna draw the picture. It goes between 10 and 120. So on the x-axis, you have 10 and you have 120. And we're gonna have a rectangle because it's uniform. 
a rectangle is going to have a base and it's going to have a height. I'll call the height H. Any questions so far? Okay. So one thing to look at, what is the probability if we have a uniform distribution between 10 and 120, what's the probability that they're going to spend between 10 and 120 minutes in with the tutor? This is really easy. If it's uniform distributed between 10 and 120, what is the probability the student will spend between 10 and 120 minutes with a tutor? The hint is it's easy, super easy. Let's see, jumping in. So if everybody spends between 10 and 120 minutes, and you select a person, what's the probability they're going to spend between 120, 10 and 120 minutes? So you said 100, it's probably what you thought was right, but, um, but it's actually one. Because remember, probabilities are between zero and one. Maybe you meant 100%. Um, but the probability is one. Does that make sense? Which is the same as 100%. Okay? So that means that the area of this rectangle is one. And the area of a rectangle is the base times the height. So I can write down area is equal to base times height, or I write BH, and that's equal to one. The base is the length on the X. And if you're going from 10 to 120, that length is 120 minus 10. We want to find H. 120 minus 10 is 110. So we can say 1 equals 110H. Divide both sides by 110. And you get H is 1 over 110. Any questions on that? Does that make sense? All right, what we want is we want the probability that the student spends between 30 and 70 minutes with the tutor. So now I'm going to draw more to the picture. Here's 30, here's 70. And we want the probability of being between 30 and 70. We want the area of this rectangle. And again, the area of a rectangle is base times the height. The base will be 70 minus 30. The height we already found is 110. And you just do 70 minus 30 is 40, and divide by 110. And if you want a decimal, you stick in the calculator. Any questions on how this works? Not too terrible? Little geometry? OK. Now let's do B. Find the first quartile, which is called Q1, remember, for the time that students spend with a math tutor. Do you remember what it means to be the first quartile? Do you remember what first quartile means? So we did that um, week one. And it's actually very important for the project. Do you remember what first quartile means? 25%. So what that means is that 25% is less than that value. So in a picture, that value is what I want. That value is not a probability. That value is an X value. It's a number of minutes. I want this number of minutes X. What I know is that the probability of being less than X is 0.25 or 25%. So the picture, I can go 10 to 120. I have this unknown X. And what I know is the area of this rectangle to the left of X is 0.25. Any questions on that idea? 
Okay, so now we put it in the formula. Area equals base times height. Area is 0.25. The base will be x minus 10. It's the right minus the left. So I can say 0.25 is b times h, which is x minus 10. The height is 1 over 110. Any questions on that? So then, algebra. OK? And I'm sure you all love algebra. <laughs> it happens a little bit in this class. Not heavy, heavy algebra. This is beginning algebra. And that is you multiply left and right by 110. And the idea is if you multiply x minus 10 times 1 over 110 by 110, you just get x minus 10. I wrote it over here, x minus 10. And then I got to multiply the left, which is 0.25, by 110. Then if I have x minus 10 equals 0 0.25 times 110, I want to find x. How do you undo subtracting 10? You add 10. And I get x equals 0 0.25 times 110 plus 10. Stick in a calculator, and you get 37.5. Any questions on kind of the process? Any questions? Okay, so, you know, just want to let you know a big warning, and it's a lot easier to watch me do it than to have to do it yourself. So make sure that you, you really practice these, a lot of these. And that'll help you out. Okay. One thing that you always want to do is say, does that is that reasonable? Does it look like about 25% is going to be below 37 and a half? And it does. If we got a number like 109, we'd worry because that'd be over here. And that's a lot more than 35%, uh, 25%. Or if we got, got a number like six, it can't be right because you can never get below 10 in this case. So it's always good to look at the answer and see if it if it makes sense, does it look like that might be about a quarter, uh, you know, of the whole rectangle? And it does. Okay, so let's do another another one. Okay, a statistics instructor will be giving extra credit to students in the top 8%, okay, based on how long they spend with the math tutor, okay? So if you spend extra time, you get some extra credit, okay? But you have to be in the top 8% of the class. At least how long must the student spend with a math tutor to get the X credit? Any questions on the question? Okay, so it turns out this is very similar. So now to be in the top 8%, that means the left, that means the right will be 0.08 but the left will be 0.92, 1 minus 0 0.08. So it's very similar. You go 1.92 equals the base times the height equals x minus 10 times 1 over 110, same idea. And then that multiply by 110, you get x minus 10 is 0.92 times 110, and add 10. And there you go. Okay. Any questions so far? I think I'm not going to do all these others because I always have them just in case we have a whole lot of time left. But but there's only ten minutes left, and we still have more. To, uh, some one more one more topic to do. Okay, so here's a big theorem. Let me tell you the first one that makes a lot of sense. If I wanted to find out the average amount of time, how would you do that? Just by looking, how would you quickly decide on the average amount of time that students spend with the tutor? The hint is it's, e it's pretty easy. Thoughts? Okay, so the idea is that the average amount of time should be right in the middle. 
should be half below and half above if it's just a uniform flat distribution like this. And to find out the number that's right in the middle, you just add them up and divide by two. Does it make sense? That's the average. So the average amount of time would be 10 plus 120, which is 130, and 130 over two, which is 65. So the formula for the average, okay, and another word for average is mu, which is also, which means mean, is just a plus b over two. You take the low, add the high, and divide by two. Any questions on this? So that is pretty intuitive. Then there's a standard deviation. And that's about as non-intuitive as it gets. Okay, there is no way you would have guessed that the standard deviation is equal to the square root of b minus a quantity squared over 12. Am I right? <laughs> I'm sure you're not saying, yeah, well, that's what I was thinking. You don't need to tell me that. <laughs> it's just, it is a formula. And again, it involves some hard calculus to kind of come up with this formula. And we don't do calculus in our class. So this is one of those, trust me, or if you don't trust me, read the book and you'll see the same formula. <laughs> So the standard deviation has this formula. It's an important formula. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to use, I want to use these formulas for practical purposes. Okay. So this is, this is an example. Okay. So pose that the number of ounces of water that people drink from the drinking fountain is uniformly distributed between one and eight ounces, okay? And the number of ounces of water that students use to fill their bottles in the drinking fountain. By the way, I'm one of them. <laughs> I'm not a student, but I use my bottle. <laughs> and I fill my bottle in the drinking fountain and that's a good way and that way I've got it in here. So the number of ounces that they use to fill their bottles in a drinking fountain is uniformly distributed between four and 16 ounces. Of course, much more than people just drink in a drinking fountain drink. Okay. You watch Thorne take a 2.5 ounce drink out of a drinking fountain and Preston fill his water bottle with five ounces of water before he runs off to class. Whose water usage is more unusually small compared to the rest of the people who use a fountain for the corresponding water usage. Any questions on the question? Any questions? Okay, so if there aren't any quick questions, um, we wanna see who is more unusual. Now, in week one, we had a measure of how unusual something is. Do you remember what that measure was? The hint is you should be able to answer it using one letter. Do you remember how you define or how you decide on how unusual something is? In statistics? I don't see you typing the one letter in. Z. Remember the Z score? The Z score is a measure of how unusual something is. Okay. And in fact, if the Z score is greater than two or less than negative two, we say we have an outlier. You remember that? So we need the Z score. So if you remember, the formula for the z-score is x minus mu over sigma. Do you remember that? Okay, if not, look at your notes, hopefully, and you'll see that that was the formula. So now what we're going to do is we're going to answer the question by looking at these two people. Okay, so Thorne drank out of the drinking fountain. Okay, so we need to find the mean and standard deviation for drinking out of the drinking fountain. 
And notice that it's uniformly distributed between one and eight. So the mean is mu is one plus eight over two. Okay, any questions on that? And one plus eight is nine, nine halves is 4.5. And the standard deviation, that's B minus A squared over 12, all under a square root. So in that case, we're gonna have B is eight, A is one, square it and divide by 12 and then take a square root. And again, calculators are good for this. Um, I would not expect it. I would not expect you to be able to um, do this in your head. Good luck. Okay. And what I got when I used calculator was 2.02. .02. That was sigma. So then we have the z score. We got to plug in x. Notice Thorne's x value was 2.5. That's how much Thorne drank. 2.5. The mean for the drinking fountain was 4.5, standard deviation was 2.02, .02, and I plug it into the formula. And I get 2.5 minus 4.5 divided by 2.02, .02, which is approximately equal to negative one. Any questions on that so far? Is that an outlier, by the way? Is Thorne an outlier? What do you think? Yes or no? Outlier? Is Thorn an outlier? Is he jumping in? Okay. We look at this number, negative one, and the outliers have to be less than negative two or greater than two. Negative one is not less than negative one, and it's certainly not greater than two. So this is not an outlier. Is that clear? All right, then we're gonna do the same thing for Preston. Preston, okay, so Preston drank five ounces of water. So Preston's X equals five. And Preston got one of these bottles. And with these bottles, we see that it's uniform between what? Okay. And it says four and 16 ounces. So it's uniform between four and 16 ounces. So A is four and B is 16. So that means to find the mean, we're gonna take four plus 16 and divide by two. Four plus 16 is 20. 20 divided by two is 10. I can do that in my head. Sigma, will be b minus a squared over 12, all under a square root, or 16 minus four quantity squared over 12, all under a square root. And that is approximately 3.46. So now we can calculate Preston's z score. We're gonna take five, that's the x, minus mu, which is the 10, the mean, and divide by the standard deviation, which is 3.46, I put that in my calculator, and I got negative 1.45. Okay, so Preston is a lot farther from zero than Thorne in terms of z-scores. Any questions on that? Still not an outlier, no outliers here, but what we can say is that Preston's water usage is more unusually small. Even though Preston you know, got more water, but you gotta think about in the context. So with the context that was given, Preston's water, Preston 
is more unusual than Thorne. Any questions at all on this example? Okay, I do want to remind you, you do not need to memorize any of these formulas, but you need to have quick access to them. So taking notes is a good idea. Make yourself a formula sheet. Good idea because, you know, tests are timed. So if it takes you, you know, 20 minutes to find the formula, it won't go well for you. <laughs> okay, if it takes you 30 seconds to find the formula, you should still have enough time. Does that make sense? Okay, so that pretty much what I needed to say for chapters four and five. And I do wanna double remind you of, you know, posting your project idea on the Project One discussion boards so that, you know, you don't, don't wait till the last minute. You wanna get this, you know, wanna get moving on it. And what I've got now is the secret word. And the secret word for week three is discrete. And that's because chapter four is all about discrete distributions. So the secret word is discrete. So make sure you write that down so that you can get the secret word quiz. The secret word is discrete. And again, that's pretty much everything I need to say about chapter three and four. I want to remind you, um, don't forget that you have to do chapter three assignment. I mean, sorry, chapter four and five. I want to remind you, you have to do chapter four assignment and chapter five assignment this week. So you have two chapter assignments, no, ten, no exams, two chapter assignments. You're also going to have to do the secret word quiz and um, the discussion post assignment. Okay. You're welcome to put in the Q&A form any questions you might have. You can also get help from a tutor. Kyle's around and knows this class really well because he's had he was my student and he's actually done this embedded tutor thing um, a few times already. So he's He's done this job and he knows what he's doing and he'll come, he can help you out too. And I can help you out, out in office hours too. And that's a pretty much all I have to say. And I wanna let you know I'll be around for questions if you have questions um, after we're done. So thanks a lot for coming. And I am going to stop the recording.